I'm going to do a part two this week. And first, I want to kind of go over what I, I shared last time in, in part one, because you, you're going to need to understand part one to understand what I'm talking about in part two. So part one, uh, I mentioned, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights of it, but we did talk a little bit about uh, that, you know, Barna, the, the Christian organization that, that surveys churches and has information about churches, says that uh, within a, a year now that one in five churches will be closing, uh, which I thought was a very interesting uh, observation and, uh, and also very serious at the same time when we think that many churches could be closing, you know, 20%. But I gave three possible scenarios. I wanted to look at what, what will things look like and I just chose the middle of January uh, 2021, and I gave three different scenarios of what things could look like. Uh, and I, I want to go over that again because I'm going to be referring back, so because I'll be saying number one, number two, or number three, and just giving the numbers later. So just so you get a, a context for it. But the number one thing, or number one scenario, and I'm using that word scenario, would be that life is starting to slowly get back to normal. Uh, maybe there is a, uh, a vaccine, or maybe they, they've come up with treatments now that the virus is, is you know, no longer any, any big deal. Um, the economy is, is starting to slowly come back and grow, and, and we haven't had a bunch of unrest. The, the election comes, the election goes, and there's not a lot of, you know, riots or things going on. Fairly peaceful. Uh, and I like that scenario just because I like my ease and I like my comfort. I don't necessarily think that's what's going to happen, but that is scenario number one. So keep that in mind. Now, scenario number two was that I just went over how throughout human history and, and, and through biblical history and what the Word says that God raises up a nation and he brings nations down. I gave a lot of scriptures in Jeremiah and Isaiah talking about, you know, the, the nations of the world are, are like a drop in the bucket. And again, he raises them up, he brings them down. And I gave examples through, throughout scripture where, uh, like with Israel, uh, they had a, basically a civil war. The northern kingdom was Israel with Samaria capital and Judah in the south with the two tribes. And how the Lord raised up. The Assyrians, after much warning uh, from the prophets that judgment was going to come unless they turn, uh, they didn't turn, and the Lord brought the Assyrians, which was kind of complex because they were actually an evil nation. And so the, the Israelites were like, you know, how can you do that, Lord? How can you bring, use a, uh, a heathen nation to come and judge us? But he did that, and he made it very clear in Scripture. He says, I am sending them. It was the Lord who was sending them. And so as the Syrian Empire comes and they conquer the northern kingdom, and, and they're, the, they're the superpower of the day. And then comes uh, the Babylonians, and they are raised up. They conquer the Syrians. Uh, and if you remember with the Assyrians, Nineveh was their capital. And we all remember the story of, of Jonah. Everybody's familiar with Jonah and what happened. We're probably not as familiar with Nahum. And Nahum is a small, uh, one of the minor prophets, which basically is when the hammer came down and Assyria was uh, destroyed by Babylon. So Babylon became the new superpower of the day. And they reign and they rule. And they're the ones who actually come against Judah and take over Judah, uh, conquer that, the remnant. Those who survive uh, from Judah are taken into captivity. And then after the, uh, uh, the Babylonians are, again, they're the superpower. And then the next power comes in is the Medes, Persians. Uh, they're raised up. And we gave the example of the, uh, out of Daniel chapter 5 where it talks about the handwriting on the wall where a hand appears and writes on the wall and says you've been weighed in the balance and you're found wanting. And that very night... The Medes and Persians captured uh, Babylon, and uh, the king, Bashizur, was killed. And he had a new empire. And then after that, 
of course, they, they reign for a while, and they're the superpower, and then here comes Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great comes in. He captures the known world, basically, by the age of 30, and defeats the, the Medes, the Persians, and they're, they're the top dog. They're the superpower of the day. He dies at a very early age, and, and his kingdom is divided up into four different generals, and they reign, and they rule for that time, and, and then, of course, the Romans are the next empire that comes. And so throughout all history, you, you see nations that are raised up, they're brought down, and in, the case, in all their cases, they, they begin to decay from the inside. So it's not necessarily an outside power that first brings the destruction, it's inwardly their culture begins to decay. And so that could very well be a possibility with us where we are weakened by our own sins, by uh, abortions of 60 million babies, the blood that's crying out of, of the, uh, even, even in churches now with the, the LPG, D, Q, Q, whatever all the letters are, are being accepted and, and, and promoted. And so falling from within, which makes it easy for enemies from the outside to come in. But in that scenario number two, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's the end of time or the end of days or the last days. It just means that it's a time of history where a nation's raised up and a nation's brought down. Now, the third scenario, and to keep this separate, it's, it's like number two for us as a nation, but the difference is that it's really a worldwide phenomenon. And like with this virus, it's a worldwide virus. It's affecting everyone. And so it affects the economies of all the, of all the nations. It, it affects uh, relations between nations and then at some point, there, there is coming a third world, world, world war, uh, and that's going to create some, uh, creates a lot of things because, you know, through the, through the biblically, you see, the, the Bible would use the word, to say, the sword, which means war, but so war is followed by famine, and that is followed by pestilence. It just kind of naturally happens that way, and so when there's a lot of chaos going on, and there's a lot of people looking for answers. There are going to be a lot of nations that are going to be willing to give up their sovereignty for peace and security. Because things are so out of control, people are willing to give up even freedom that they might have peace and security, which ushers in eventually a one-world government and also a, um, the Antichrist, which will be coming on the scene, who will be look like the savior of the world and all that goes on with that. And I look at a couple different verses, but going back to, to scenario number one where things get back to normal, I did, I did give a scripture out of um, 2 Kings uh, chapter 20, and I'll just paraphrase that for you. But in that case, it was where uh, Hezekiah, who was a king of uh, Judah, had... Uh, been given, he was sick, he was given 15 more years to live, and then later after that, there's some envoys from uh, Babylon come to him, and he shows them his palace, and he shows them all his riches, and his gold, and his silver, and, and all that, you know, they've done, and they've built, and then after they leave, Isaiah the prophet comes, and he says, who were those men, and where did they come from, and and Hezekiah says, well, they came from a far country called Babylon, and, they, and what did you show them? He said, well, I showed them everything that was in my treasure, within our kingdom. And then Isaiah said, basically paraphrasing, he said, the word of the Lord is that I am going to be sending the Babylonians, and they will take everything that you showed them, and they will take your people in captivity and even your own sons and daughters and grandchildren will be made eunuchs and serve in the king's, you know, king of Babylon's kingdom. And what was kind of astounding was that was Hezekiah's response, which was, the word you have said is good. And you go, really? So wait, because he said, he thought, it says in that scripture, he says, I will have peace and security in my days. And so we don't want to be as Hezekiah was, 
if things do happen to get back to normal, if life goes on, we want to be concerned about what's going to be coming in the future for our children and for our grandchildren. Now, some of the things that uh, I thought, you know, as far as what our response should be, and I gave the, um, you know, out of Matthew 25 about the ten virgins, five were wise and five were, were foolish, and I exhorted us to get oil. And oil is a, a symbol or is used many times as the Holy Spirit. So that each of us to get, make sure we're, we're connected, that we're spending time, that we're getting deeper with the Lord, that we're getting oil. So that when that time comes, we will be like a wise virgin who had oil in our lamp. And then I ended kind of with that scripture, which everyone knows, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. You know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. And so that's what our, obviously our hope is, that there be enough people praying and interceding and repenting that the Lord turns from what he wanted to do. And after that, I ask each of you to spend uh, 20 minutes a day for the rest of that month just praying for our nation, praying for the upcoming election, praying for revival for the church all across the nation, praying for a third great awakening to come to this nation that would change the heart of the people and turn them back to the Lord. And pray that our own lamps would be full of oil and that we would be prepared for whatever it is that is coming our way. So that was, that was uh, part one. And I, I, again, one of the familiar with the one, two, and three options, because I, like I say, I'll be referring back to that. Now, this message in part two is not a, a typical uh, three-point message, three points, and then, uh, you know, introduction, three points, and a conclusion. This is like, this is going to be like a bullet point. In fact, I, I kind of have written down here, it's like a shotgun with birdshot. In other words, it's going to, I'm shooting out, some pellets are going to hit you, some pellets are going to hit somebody else, some Pellets, you're going to go, what in the heck was that about? So, as Scott likes to say, if the shoe fits, wear it. Now, on part one, I remember that's, uh, that's when Jerry Nash had, had given us a, a, a scripture that kind of uh, gave me a confirmation that what, what I was going to be sharing was the right thing. Well, I actually had the same thing happen Saturday. I was, uh, actually it was Gene Slusher had sent us a, a message from uh, John Kilpatrick. I don't know if you guys remember who John Kilpatrick was. He was the one who was a, the pastor. You know, there are two big revivals in the 90s. One was at the Toronto, Canada, Toronto Blessing. The other one was the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida, where thousands and thousands of people were saved, set free, delivered, healed, awesome miracles happened. Uh, we even had gone down there during that time to Pensacola and saw that. And you'd, you'd stand out in front of the church, you know, lying a couple hours, you know, two or three hours before the church service, you know, people would be lined up all the way down the block trying to get in. So he was that pastor. Uh, after that, he became uh, kind of was mentoring other pastors, and he became a pastor of pastors. And then recently, he's been uh, a pastor of a church. It's called uh, Church of His Presence, and it's in Alabama, down on the Ghost Coast. It's a pretty, but you know, mega church, very large church. And I would suggest that each of you get that message if you just uh, would consult Rabbi Google and put in Lord of His Presence and. Uh, uh, it, the church website will come up, and then it was that date, uh, which was last Sunday, which was the, the 11th. And it was called the Days of Reckoning. And what had happened, uh, actually, that was their first time back together as a, as a church. You know, to, you know, everything else, I guess, had been video, apparently, up to that time. Uh, so they were back in, actually, in presence in the church, and that Thursday before last Sunday, he had a, a visitation from the Lord, and the Lord had told him, 
uh, within 30 days, the days of reckoning were going to start. And it, he didn't say a day of reckoning, but days. In other words, that unless there is a wholehearted return to the Lord, that judgment was going to begin to start being poured out. And that the Lord's protection and protective hand was going to be removed from the nation. And so, uh, again, it was a, a very sobering message, and, and he said that nothing has shaken him uh, in his life like that, that, that word did to him. And, he, and so he was warning the church. So, you know, I had used the term scenario uh, on those three different things that could happen, and not options, just because I don't think it's really, the last two probably are not a necessary an option. One and two could be changed by our intercession and by our prayers, and that's why we're, we're encouraging people to do that. And, you know, since that message I gave last month, there have been two big uh, Prayer events in Washington, D.C., you know, Jonathan Kahn had his return um, event where thousands of people were there, and so did uh, Franklin Graham. Also, the same day, he had one there. So there were thousands of Christians that were in Washington, D.C. They were praying. It's funny you don't see that on the news. You know, you, you see all these little riots and stuff, but you got thousands thousands of people in Washington, D.C. Don't even mention it. But they were praying, and they were uh, repenting. And praying for mercy for our nation. And I know that uh, across the nation, other churches have been doing that. There have been other prayer gatherings, you know, in other cities all across the nation. But the question, uh, this is the question that Glenna always asks. So how many, how many does it take? How many does it take to tip the scales? Only God knows, Right? Is that a percentage? Is it a number? What, what is it? Where do we get that point where it tips the scales and the Lord relents and he turns? And again, the only, only the Lord knows that. I do want to look at a couple of scriptures now. Let's go to Jeremiah. Because there are things that are called the perhaps of the Lord. So Jeremiah chapter 26 And we're going to look at verses uh, 1 through 3. And it says, Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord said. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them, I command you, do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen, and each will turn from his evil way. Then I will relent and not bring on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. So the Lord tells Jeremiah to, to preach the word, to preach what he's given him, and perhaps the Lord, or perhaps the people will turn, turn from the evil way, will repent, and then he could relent of the disaster that he was planning on bringing them. Now, unfortunately for, for Jeremiah, you know, he, he ministered 40 years bringing the word to Judah. And after two, 40 years of ministry, he got two converts. So not the greatest, maybe, success, but he did what he was supposed to do. He shared the word. He kept, kept pushing it, kept, you know, he went to... He was in prison. He was on bread and water. He was thrown in a well. He went in the mud. All the stuff that happened to him. He was in stocks. He continued to, to speak the truth. But after that 40 years, judgment came. But there's always that perhaps. If we will, if God's people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. A similar uh, Scripture is in Joel chapter 2. 
So turn over the minor prophet, Joel. Joel chapter 2, and verses 12 and 14. And it says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. So the Lord is slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. And who knows? In other words, of enough. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. So that's the perhaps of the Lord. You know, when I was with uh, Crisis Response International, we worked a lot with uh, FEMA, and FEMA has a, like a five-step program of disaster response, and the first, uh, number one, is, is mitigation. And mitigation means to lessen, to lessen the severity of. So like in the case of FEMA, that means prepossessioning supplies and equipment. Uh, it means like if you're in an earthquake uh, area, zone, uh, make sure that the building requirements are being met to withstand earthquakes. And so it's, it's called mitigation. But for us as Christian, mitigation is intercession. It's praying to the Lord. It's interceding. The Lord, again, would have mercy and have grace. I'm really, like I say, this is, is shotgun, so just be careful what you hear. What, don't be surprised if it doesn't make a lot of, it seems disjointed because it is, but that's all right. So I'm, not, I'm really not a numbers guy, but uh, for years I have seen 11-11, and this actually started clear back in the 90s, and actually it was Glenna who first started seeing it. Lord would wake her up in the night, and she'd look at the clock, and it would say 11, 11, and it kept happening, and she'd say, every time I look, see the clock, it's 11, 11. I said, well, you lay down and go to sleep, you know. <clears throat> well, then I started seeing the same thing was happening to me, and I'd wake up 11, 11, and then I'd, during the day, just happen to look at the clock, and it'd be 11, 11. And I began to think, okay, well, what is going on? And we went to a conference. It was a prophetic conference in Kansas City. And it actually started on 11, 11 of that year. But I went there. And so we got there early because I wanted to get up fairly close. So we were like in the you know, third, fourth row. And there were like, I don't know, probably 1,500 people there. And I hear the couple in front of me. And they're talking about with another couple, and they're saying, have you been seeing 11-11? So I'm tapping on, you been seeing 11 Yeah. And so the, the guy who, uh, pastor who came up to welcome the people in, he said, how many people have been seeing 11-11? And I bet two-thirds of the people raised their hands. Now, what does that mean? You know, that, you know some people say 11 has to do with judgment. Some people say it's 11th hour. Some people say it's Isaiah 11:11, 11, 11, which has to do with uh, the return of Israel. Some say it's Matthew 11:11, 11, 11, which has to do where Jesus says, you know, John the Baptist was the greatest. Uh, no one greater than John the Baptist had been born, but he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. And so, yeah, and also like the Mayflower Compact, by the way, was on 11:11, 11, 11, 16, whatever that year was. So there's a lot of different, different ideas uh, about what it is or what it could mean or what verse it is. But I, I take it in a bigger sense as 11.11 does have to do with end time events in the future. And in fact, we had it so much that uh, back when I was uh, pastoring at the Baptist church, 
we, had, we opened a coffee house, which happened to be the old bar in Drexel. And uh, it was a Christian coffee house, and uh, we called it 1111 Coffee House. In fact, my friend David and Janie Wood over here, who Scott prophesied to, uh, used to work there with us before they went to Babylon or Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, <clears throat> moved. But anyway, and, uh, and where's Greg? Well, Greg's not in here right now, is he? But Greg, oh, you are back here. So Greg Smith was in our church at the time. So he, was, he, he would come. He lived in Adrian, and he, he came. And then there's a, little, a girl there from Drexel by the name of Shauna, and he, she tells her girlfriend, hey, that boy's cute. And then I think later then Greg saw Shauna and goes, hubba, hubba. And, uh, <clears throat> and several years later, yeah, I got to marry them. So that's a cool story. So there was some fruit that came from the marriage. I'm sure Anna and Blake and, yeah, I'd be all happy that you guys met. But anyway. But anyway, besides the 11, 11 thing is, but in the last two weeks, I've been seeing 9-11. Now, because it's been such a short time, I'm not ready to, uh, to say it's not more than just a coincidence, but I've been seeing it, and to me, what that means is, is, is an urgency. It's, uh, you know, 9-11 is emergency, it's urgency that things are getting closer and, and things are going to be uh, a lot more chaotic than what they are now. Things are going to be shaken. So if this is the season of number two, or number three, the natural question a lot of times becomes within us is, and what the scripture will say sometimes will be, well, who can stand? Who can stand in those hours? And I want to look at a couple of scriptures, Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. And in Revelation chapter 6, it, you know, there's a lot of things about the judgment. And, you know, we have a, a throughout Revelation, you have a 21 series of, of judgments. You know, the bowls, the trumpets, all that. And it's after, you know, it says, a, a th- you know, a third of, of the population is killed. And then right after that, in verse 17, it will say, For the great day of the wrath, of their wrath has come, who can stand? And so I think that's a natural reaction time, is basically fear. But, and another scripture would be Joel, you don't need to turn there, Joel 2.11, and it says, the day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful, who can endure? That whole same scenario who can endure? Now, Joel's day was a different day of the Lord. In fact, there have been several days of the Lord throughout biblical history, but there is one capital D, day of the Lord, meaning the last day. But it also says in Joel 3.16, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people. So in those times, the Lord will be a refuge. So no matter what is shaking outside, what what craziness is going on, uh, we can take that security that the Lord will be a refuge for us. And the Lord is not in heaven. He's not wringing his hands. And uh, so it may look like things are out of control to us. It's not to him. And the other thing to remember, he always has a remnant. There's always a remnant of God's people that he has purposes and plans and protection for. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Chronicles. It was chapter 12. It was interesting, last week, Sonny, uh, who is the head president of Church on the Rock International, or Church on the Rock Network of Churches, had sent this, this uh, verse to us. And... Uh, it, I have used it several times in, in the recent times. 
but First Chronicles chapter 12, as soon as I can find it, and we're going to look at, let me in a second, I need First Chronicles 12 and verse 32. And I'm still in Second Chronicles. And it says, The men of Issachar, who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. So the men of Issachar, they understood the times. In other words, they understood the season we are in. And they knew what action to take. So it's critical that we as a people become like the men of Issachar. That we understand the times, we understand the seasons, and more importantly, we know what the response should be. So that's something to pray, to ask the Lord that you want to be like the men of Issachar, who knew the times, who knew the seasons, and knew how to respond and what to do. Now, in the next, uh, I'm going to look at the scripture. You can't see this from where you are, but top of my Bible, it says on the next preceding page, it says 52608. And I got San Fran written there. And what that is, is in uh, May 26, uh, 2008. I was kind of on a prophetic journey with uh, uh, Sean Malone and a couple other guys uh, with Crisis Response International, and we were going down the West Coast. We'd gone to uh, Sacramento, and we worked our way down. We were meeting with different church leaders. We were meeting with different uh, uh, heads of houses of prayer. And on this particular day, we were in San Francisco, and we met... Uh, at the San, Fr San Francisco House of Prayer, which is right on Haight-Ashbury. And if you guys remember anything about Haight-Ashbury, that was the epicenter uh, of the hippie movement, the Summer of Love in 1967. And so we've got a house of prayer right there. And uh, the man who uh, is the leader of that is called, his name is Roger Joyner. And so we met, went to the house of prayer, we met with him, and then he took us down took us down to a, a coffee house down the street. And it was interesting because I was there by accident in 1967. We were on a vacation in some way. My, my dad took a wrong turn, and we ended up right in the center of all that. And I remember going in, and, and there were like 100 Hells Angels first. And then you went into this park, and there was this flower children and hippies, and it, I mean, wall to wall. And I think some of those same people were, I saw on the sidewalk that were, <clears throat> you know, still drugged out. But anyway, and so we were walking down to this, to this um, coffee house, and it was interesting. There were a, a group of lesbians that were coming on the sidewalk the same way, and they looked at us, and then they started just snarling, just hissing and snarling, you know. It's like, you know. One of the guys says, did you see that? I said, well, yeah, I saw that. You know, it's like they recognized in the spirit what was going on. And it was, I mean, it's a heavy oppression right there. And those people who minister in that day in and day out. Anyway, so he took us to the coffee house, and we're just kind of making uh, conversation. And we're telling him what he's doing and asking how they're doing. And, and then he, all of a sudden, he gives us a prophetic word. And it's out of Second Chronicles. And so I'm going to now give... The, what I received, I'm going to impart or convey to this body. And so it's chapter 12, and it's verse 8. Actually, it's verse 8 through 15. And it says, Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold in the desert. They were brave warriors, ready for battle, and able to handle the sword and spear. Now their faces were the faces of lions, and they were as swift as gazelles in the mountains. Elzar was a chief, Obadiah 
the second command, Elab the third, Mishman the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Atai the sixth, Eli the seventh, Jonathan the eighth, Elzabad ninth, Jeremiah the tenth, and Mac, whatever his name is, Macne the, the eleventh. It's interesting, there's eleven of them. These Gadites were army commanders, and the least was a match for hundreds and the greatest for thousands. It was they who crossed the Jordan in the first month when, the overflow, when, the, when it was overflowing all its banks, and they put to flight everyone living in the valley to the east and to the west. So I just pronounce that, that blessing, that promise of the Gadites that we would be a people like that, that no matter what is coming our way, what the future may hold, that we would be those leaders, that we would be those, those who set to flight thousands, who stand strong for the Lord. So with the different things that could be coming our way, what is God's mercy in the coming storm? I'm not going to go into any depth on this, but just to say, just as the Lord said he'd be a refuge for us, there are people who are called to be builders of places of refuge. Some people use the term safe places. Some people use the term storehouses. They are places of protection and provision and places of the manifest presence of the Lord. Now that can be a home, that could be a church, that could be a town, or even a city. I don't like to use cities of refuge just because if you go to the Old Testament, they, had, they were also called cities of refuge, but that, that was where the manslayer fled to. But there are places of a divine protection, places where God's safety, where his provision is, and a place where the manifest presence of the Lord is resting on those places. Now, Scott was talking earlier about uh, Egypt. So let's go to Exodus chapter 8. I want to talk about the Goshen principle. Exodus chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 20. And it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh, and as he goes to the water and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of, of Egypt, of the Egyptians, will be full of flies, even the ground where they are. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there so that you will know that I and the Lord am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will occur tomorrow. So the Lord, the Lord is sending a, a judgment of flies, and it makes you wonder, you know, what did that look like? Like, it leaves the land, you know, all of a sudden the flies just stop. Go have that work. But he made a distinction between his people and the people of the world, the Egyptians in this case. And it's interesting that this was the first miracle. See, all the other miracles up to this time, the, uh, the magicians of Egypt was able to duplicate. So when Moses, you know, threw down his staff and turned to the snake, they were able to do the same thing. So there was a, 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 an amount of power 
that they had till they got to a certain point, and then they could not duplicate it. But it's called a Goshen principle. It means where God will make a distinction in places between God's people and the people of the world. And some will use the term limited immunity, where there's a there's certain amount of, of immunity from what is going on in the rest of the world. Also, it will be a place where uh, the verse John fourteen twelve, which says the, where Jesus says, you know, the works that I do, you shall do, and greater works shall I, you do, because I go to the Father. We, we have yet to see that fulfilled. It will be fulfilled before the coming of the Lord. Not only the works that Jesus did, but greater works than he did. So it's in that context of all this swirl, of all these things that are going on, all this chaos, that the Lord raises up a standard. All right, turn to Luke chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 54 through 56. So in verse 54, he said, He said to the crowd, When you see a cloud rising in the west... Immediately you say, it is going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? So we need to be watching interpreting what is going on, not to be, as this crowd was, not interpreting the times and the seasons. Now, here's another one that I don't, doesn't fit at all with anything that I'm doing right now, but for some reason, I'm supposed to give that, but it's in Luke 23, but it's when Jesus is being led to the crucifixion, and the women are weeping behind him as he's going, and he says, he turns to them and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for your, your, your children and your grandchildren. Now, we should expect both the supernatural. Let's say these are bullet points. So we should both expect the supernatural and at the same time plan responsibly in the natural. Okay, so we need to expect the supernatural, but at the same time plan responsibly in the natural. Uh, Turn to Acts chapter 11. I want to give you an example of that. Acts chapter 11 and verse 27. It says, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, one of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine was spread over the entire Roman world. Now, this happened during the reign of Claudius. Now, the disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did with their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So Agabus, you know, as he gives this, this prophetic word that there's a you know, famine coming, you know, he didn't go, okay, you know, Judah's got a lot of rocks. There's a lot of stones in Judah. We'll just pray that the Lord just turns those rocks to bread. 
No, it was a, it was a practical application. He said, you know, I'm telling you this ahead of the time. So they begin to prepare, take up offerings in the natural for peop- for, to be a blessing to those people in Judea. So there's, there's a place for both the supernatural and a place for the natural. And you have to be able to determine what's what. And some of you are going to be called into the natural, preparing things. Other you are going to be more on the spiritual side. Now, the Lord is raising up forerunners. Again, in both the spiritual and the natural. Let's look at Luke chapter 3. Just give us some examples. In verses 2 to 7. In verse 2, chapter 3, says, During the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance and for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight his path for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill may low. The crooked road shall become straight, and the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. So John said to the crowd coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you? To flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit and keeping with repentance. So I don't think John the Baptist was much of a seeker friendly friendly uh, church. No, <clears throat> you brood of vipers, who warned you? But he was preparing the way in the in the way of the spirit, spiritually preparing people. Now, in the same way, we can look in the, in the natural, we look at the life of Joseph. You, know, you all know this, the story of Joseph's life, what he went through. You know, we do that song about the, the pressing and the crushing. Well, he went through a lot of pressing, he went through a lot of crushing, but the Lord set him in a place where he was second in authority over all the land of Egypt. And, you know, the dream that Pharaoh had about the, the, the cows and the seven lean years and the seven, and the seven, uh, or the seven plentiful years and the seven lean years, and how Joseph, again, he began to prepare in the natural. He began to make storehouses, do things in the natural, preparing things so that when those seven lean years came, he would have provision for the people. And so it's both. It's, it's, the, it's the supernatural, it's the spiritual, and it's also the natural. And the Lord is raising up Joseph's, a Joseph's company for such a time as this. Okay, next bullet. We all need to take personal preparedness seriously. You all need food and water for blank people for blank time. And that's what you have to fill in the blank. What the Lord is telling you to do. That you have enough provisions that you can provide for your family or if it's just two of you or if God's calling you for for more than that, that you need to be seeking the Lord so that you're not uh, standing in line at at a FEMA camp wanting food and water. But again, you need to be led by the Spirit. And speaking of being led by the Spirit, 
you know, so much is situational. So like Jesus in the Gospels, there were times when it says he was unwilling to walk in Judea because of the Jews. There's other times he went to Jerusalem and the disciples are going, what? The Jews were now just trying to kill you and you're going to Jerusalem? Which tells you it's, it's situational. It's being led by the Spirit. It's not a, a set uh, rule of how you respond. And that's why we have to be led by the Spirit and why you need to have oil in your lamp. Because each situation is different and what the Lord is telling you may be something completely different than what the Lord is telling someone else. So to be led by the Spirit. You know, again, we used to, uh, to teach preparedness. Uh, did that for, for several years, uh, different groups. You know, I would do a lot of, of you know, how to, how to purify water, water usage. You know, uh, Glenna did a lot of things on food and food preparation, food storage. But we found a lot of times people get so lost in the details of wanting a list and uh, what they need to do rather than realizing that the most important part of preparedness is spiritual. Being prepared spiritually and being in that place. But you do need to have your two low or your yeah, two loaves and five fishes if you want it multiplied. The little boy at least he had that. Make sure you have oil in your lamps. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all else, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. About your attitudes, especially it's about offense. Do not become offended at God for what he does, or for what he doesn't do. And that happens a lot. People have an expectation of something happening, it didn't happen, and they're really offended at God. And that doesn't work out well. I'm going to read you a passage out of Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. It says, for my ways, or my, well, let me start again. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. So many times we think that the, you know, that the Lord is thinking like, we do, but his, his thoughts are so much higher. And his end game is so much glorious, glory. And yet, we may not always understand what's going on. It may not make sense to us. It may be a place, well, Lord, why are you letting this happen? But the Lord is in heaven. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And we need to see from eternity viewpoint. And not from our, our short time that we're here on earth. That he has a plan. He is working it out. And while we may be shocked, he is not shocked. Now the good news in all of this, being at number two or being number three, is that this will be the time of the greatest revival and greatest harvest of souls in the history of mankind. So it's in that context of chaos is in that context of sometimes it's going to be suffering, of, of things happening that we don't necessarily understand, but people will begin to ask questions. People who were not interested in hearing what you had to say are all of a sudden going to have ears to hear what you're saying. So if you want to see scenario number one, and you're kind of like me, you like your ease and your comfort, and you want to see the republic preserved, 
We better get serious about praying, interceding for our nation, asking the Lord for mercy and grace. You know, Habakkuk 3.12 says, in wrath, remember mercy. But at the same time, he knew that you'd be alive at this time in history. He knew, and you may be surprised, but he was not surprised that you are here now, that you are in this time, in this season of world history, and he will give you everything you need. If you just stay hooked to the vine, if you stay hooked to him, stay in connection with him, praying and not being shook. Because I think a lot of what happens is with initial things that are some of the things that are going to be happening. I'll go back to, you know, 9-11. I told you a while back that uh, 2001, when that happened, that that was one of the birth pangs, initial birth pangs. Well, 19 years have gone by. 19 years, and it's interesting that with Judah, when Babylon first came in, they took some of the people, took some of the riches, but they left some people there, and they, they, didn't, they didn't completely destroy it or anything. But it was a 19-year period from that point when Babylon came again because they had, they had rebelled against the king of Babylon and completely destroyed the temple, tore down the walls. Devastation. And so it was a 19-year period there. And here we are now in our nation with a 19-year period since 2001, since 9-11. But, again, I want to bring hope that, you know, the, the Lord is a refuge for his people. He will once again make a distinction between his people and the people of the world. That doesn't mean there's not going to be martyrs. In fact, I've talked to the Lord about, about that, about being a martyr, and I said, you know, I think Scott and Nathan will make much better mar martyrs than I would. So... <clears throat> Just, you know, just saying, but, uh, but there's a glorious future. And so I don't think we want to focus on the negativity of things that may be happening, but you, at the same time, you need to be prepared so you're not shook, you're not shaken. And just as, as Pastor Kirkpatrick said, you know, uh, days of reckoning, days of reckoning coming our way, but they're days of great glory also. A day where you, as Isaiah 60 says, arise and shine. In the midst of, of gross darkness, your light is going to shine that much brighter. So again, there were a lot of pellets went out. I hope some of you got hit by one. Hopefully it's the right one. And some of those things will apply to you. Some of the things won't apply. So just be asking the Lord. And again, just... Make sure you're getting oil in your lamp.